Time to talk more Michigan football as we are joined as we are every week on Couch Ball Weekly with Anthony Bellino, the host of the Morning Blitz on Fox Sports Radio 1230 here in Toledo, as well as X's and Bros. And Anthony, it has not been a good couple of weeks for Michigan in terms of the win-loss column, and it hasn't been a good couple of weeks for Michigan in terms of injuries. The latest one, Aiden Hutchinson, the defensive end, who, who has played well the first two games. He got hurt early in that game against Indiana, and now we learn there is a, a fracture in the lower right leg. Reportedly, it's an ankle fracture, and he's going to require surgery. So the Wolverines will be without Aiden Hutchinson for probably the rest of this season. Yeah, the, Mark, always good to see you. Sorry it's under these circumstances. We should be talking about a 3-0 team that's uh, making a push and a charge in the college football playoff and should be competing against the uh, Ohio State Buckeyes at that level. That's the expectation that has uh, failed to, been, to be reached. And when you talk about the loss of Aiden Hutchison, now the good news is, if there is any good news of the silver lining, he is a junior. Uh, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic that's going on, uh, you get a free year of eligibility this year and he'll have a senior season as well. So he can go into surgery uh, for the leg, get that repaired, get back on the field, and effectively have two years of eligibility left if he so chooses uh, to use them. But I think that when you take away Aiden Hutchinson from a front seven and a front four, more importantly, that we discussed going into the year, and we discussed after the win against Minnesota, how dominant that performance was. We didn't really know what to make of it, other than you know the fact that you could be excited as a Michigan fan about what that defense brought to the table. That defense has not looked good the last two weeks. The front four can't get any pressure. The front seven combined uh, is not affecting the quarterback of the opposition whatsoever. Now you take away one of their best players. Uh, this is a nightmare situation uh, right here for the defense because I, I think that, and I know we're going to get to the offense here in a, in a second, but th this is Michigan we're talking about. It's not like the cupboards are bare. They are recruiting at one of the higher levels in college football. They are recruiting top 25 talent uh, year after year after year. So you shouldn't necessarily effectively be able to plug and play, but you should be able to find somebody uh, within your, within your, I don't know, your stable, if you will, that can come in and make an impact. I don't know who that person is going to be, but this defense uh, without any pressure on the quarterback, you leave your corners uh, on an Island. Once again, we see Michael Penick jr. And everybody else uh, who wants to play quarterback against Michigan, push the ball downfield two weeks in a row, uh, both he and Rocky Lombardi having success throwing the ball downfield because the corners can't uh, cover that long. The corners can't cover long because the defense can't provide any pressure up front. So it is a, it, when you talk about complimentary football, this is a bad mix right now, Mark, and uh, things are not looking good in Ann Arbor. Taylor Upshaw, one of those guys who is expected to step up with Aiden Hutchinson out for the remainder of the season. And Taylor Upshaw talked about how this is a do-or-die time. And do-or-die in terms of his own personal growth on the defensive line, but do-or-die for the team as well as they are 1-2. and two. Wisconsin coming to the big house on a Saturday night. And we talked about how the offensive line... Beginning of the season, there was some experience on the offensive line, but not a lot of depth, not a lot of experience in that depth, and that was certainly proved true against Indiana as a couple of guys that were out, so they had to reshuffle that offensive line. And I, I think for, for three quarters, that offensive line did a good job in pass protection, but they couldn't do much running the ball. And then by the fourth quarter, they were starting to get a lot of heat onto the quarterback, Joe Milton. So that, that offensive line, a rejiggered offensive line against Indiana, that's leaving some questions going forward as well as the injuries that have hurt on that side of the ball. Oh, extremely, extremely concerning if, if you are in that uh, that Michigan locker room right now, because once again, the coverage are not bare. Ed Warner's done a great job as the offensive line coach being able to produce talent, uh, get guys, coach them up and get them to the next level to play football. Uh, you know, you look at last year's draft, four out of five guys uh, end up getting picked up by NFL teams. And it's like, OK, the talent is most definitely there. Not necessarily a plug and play situation, but you should find somebody who can get off the ball. And I think that a lot of times in a lot of different offenses, as we as we take a look at the way offense is being ran now across the country, not only at the collegiate level, but also at the high school level, a lot of teams moving towards spread offenses, a lot of teams uh, moving towards trying to pass the ball almost first. So what's happening is you're having offensive linemen that are learning to take their first step backwards. That's why you see a lot of young guys come in and they do decently and uh, decently solid in pass protection, but not necessarily really good in, in when you talk about run blocking, because they're not getting off the ball and moving people forward. Yeah. You, know, you need to have road graders, right? You got to have offensive linemen that play with a little nasty. We don't need offensive linemen that, that, that eat with forks and knives. We need them to eat with their hands, right? You need them to be aggressive, angry, mean spirited individuals. And I think that when you have younger guys coming in, 
in to play Big Ten football, you have to learn to get off the line of scrimmage, get up, get your hands on somebody, and be able to move that body out of the way to create holes and create separation. You look at the run game for Michigan last week against Indiana, absolutely non-existent. And when you have a team like Indiana who has forced you offensively to become now one-dimensional, it is much easier to defend the pass when you know that the pass is coming. That's the, the, the benefit of being able to have a really good run game is being able to mix it up and have diversity when it comes to your play calling. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, Joe Milton was decent throughout most of the game, uh, threw a couple of picks, one he really forced there, and it was, you know, it, and he was under heat. He was like, as you mentioned, he was under pressure constantly because if you have no effective run game, if you get behind on the scoreboard, you start to press a little bit. I also think it's interesting how, you, know, you try to establish the run early. It doesn't work. So you immediately go away from it. And then you continue to kind of go away from it uh, until it's all you're doing is passing the football. And that to me is a recipe for disaster. And it's a recipe that has Indiana picking up their first win against Michigan since 1987. You want to know who was born in 1987? This guy. That's right. They, I, I have not seen Indiana beat Michigan in my entire life. I should have expected it this season uh, with the way that last week went against Michigan State that this would be the year that they would snap that streak. Yeah, I mentioned it last week on the show. 1987 was peak history of Indiana because he had the movie Hoosiers released. The basketball team won the national championship. John Cooper Mellencamp had two number one hits in 1987. And in 1987, the Indiana football team beat Ohio State and they beat Michigan. So it's, it's, it's 1987 all over again, perhaps, in the uh, Hoosier state. Let's talk a little bit about that rushing attack because I, I'm of two minds. I, I understand this, this idea of carry the, split the carries, have a fresh guy coming back almost every down, had a lot of different guys who can run the ball, but at the same time, if you don't have a running back, you don't have a dominant running back who gets into rhythm, you don't have a guy that can maybe break one free, and maybe that can help that offensive line that's maybe struggling to find chemistry. So what are your thoughts on, on this, the running back room? Because you've got some talent there, but none of those guys are really getting enough carries to really become a dominant running back. No, and, and I love the, the, the depth that they have between Hassan Haskins, Chris Evans, Zach Charbonnet. Zach Charbonnet had one carry for four yards. Uh, Hassan Haskins had six carries for 19 yards. He was the leading rusher, six carries for 19 yards. Like, that's unfathomable if you are a Michigan fan. And then Chris Evans with three carries for five yards. A total of 13 net yards on 18 carries in the run game. It doesn't bother me that maybe – I think that Has Hassan Haskins might be that lead back uh, with Zach Charbonnet adding that uh, that boost, if you will, um, you know, that can, that can kind of be the change of pace a little bit. And then Chris Evans is kind of – you know, a little bit undersized in comparison to like the thick body running back that you're used to seeing, but has great hands to be able to catch the ball in the backfield. So he adds a little more, uh, um, I don't know, versatility, if you will, than maybe the other two do. But the the complete lack of touches uh, for the running backs in this in this ball game was was mind boggling to me. Like I could not understand you know, six carries for Hassan Haskins, a guy that completely ran over uh, Minnesota at some point, and, and maybe it's in the scheme, right? And maybe maybe you have to motion a tight end. Maybe it's a little wrinkle here or there to try to set up that run game. It's a delay out of a shotgun. It, it's something to try to, you know, get creative play calling wise when you know that, hey, we can't line up, you know, going in a, in a 13 personnel grouping uh, where you or, or a, pardon me, an 11 personnel grouping where you have one tight end and one running back and three wide receivers and just trying to run to the strong side of the field like that might not work out. You know, if you want to get even even a little bit more in depth and add two tight ends in there, if you're going to do so, then you have to incorporate the play action passing game to be able to open up that run game a little bit. I just didn't I didn't see anything effective out of Michigan's run game whatsoever. And there's a lot of concerns across the board. I would say the secondary and the defense as a whole is concern number one. But the inability to run the football the last two weeks, that is definitely 1A as far as my list of concerns with this football team right now. I'm always going to look for positives. And one positive I think we have seen out of the Michigan offense has been the young wide receivers. Because of transfers, because of leaving for the NFL early, because of opting out, we knew these young guys were going to get an opportunity this year. And we've seen Roman Wilson, we've seen Cornelius Johnson both come through. And there are certainly some talent in those young receivers. And that's helping Joe Milton. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, Roman Wilson, Ronnie Bell, uh, Cornelius Johnson, you know, the, these guys, uh, I'd like to see Nick Eubanks a little bit more involved uh, in the offense with only one reception uh, last game. But all in all, I think that uh, the, the big three, Bell, Johnson, and Wilson, I think that they have been great. And, and you know, I don't know how much you could really ask of them when your quarterback's under duress and he's having to make some throws that you probably wouldn't like to see him make if, as far as just chucking it down, down the field and, and running to it. I thought that maybe last year 
with Shea Patterson at quarterback, that might have been a better opportunity for Joe Milton to step in and throw receivers open when you had uh, Tariq Black and Nico Collins and Donovan Peoples-Jones. You had these three threats out there that you could literally throw wherever you wanted to, and odds are one of those guys was going to come down with it. This year, a little bit different. I think that all three, uh, whether it's uh, Roman, uh, whether it's Ronnie, or, or whether it's Cornelius, all three are very good possession receivers. They're all very sure-handed uh, for the most part, and I think that they've, they've made some tough grabs. Joe Milton is not afraid to throw that ball in a tight window. So I'll give him credit for that sometimes. Uh, but other times, like you, you wonder some of these shots that these guys take, the fact that they're even able to hold on to the ball, in, in, especially in all the traffic that is there. I think that they've been a, a real bright spot. When you talk about positives, I think the wide receivers, that's one area of this football team you can look at and say, hey, you know, we, we have guys that can catch the football. They can catch it in space. They can catch it in traffic. We just got to find a better way to get it to them. I think football coaching staffs are, are very similar to a presidential cabinet, and there's always power struggles. There's always who has the ear of the head coach. And I think a couple of years ago we saw a power struggle on that defensive staff, and, and certainly Don Brown won, won that power struggle. Greg Madison chose to leave Michigan. We know where he is at now. Did Don Brown get maybe too much credit for what Greg Madison built in Ann Arbor defensively? I think that's a legitimate question. Um, and I think that Don Brown's, uh, I don't know, reluctancy maybe, to change things up, uh, it's not the you know Dr. Don is not dialing up a defense that is that is working for this team right now. And if you're not going to adjust, you know Michigan State literally laid the playbook out for the entire conference to take a look at. And I think that they all they had to do was turn on the Ohio State film uh, from last season and say, hey, this is what works out really well. Push the ball downfield and push the ball o o over the middle and crossing routes because Michigan's going to have a very difficult time defending both of those. And I think that when you look at Don Brown and you look at the way that Michigan has surrendered 300 yard game after 400 yard game after 500 yard game, like you cannot allow that to happen. Something has to change, whether it is who's going to make the decision or it's schematically, however you want to look at it. I don't care what it is, but something's got to give here because you cannot continue to put your cornerbacks in positions where they can't be successful. Let's like, we can flat out face it. We don't have lockdown, shutdown corners out there. It's not like you have Richard Sherman on one side, Jalen Ramsey on the, on the other. That's just not the case. You know, poor Vincent Gray's out there just getting roasted uh, every weekend. I mean, the guy looks like burnt toast, but he's not getting any help. So it's like, what do you really want the young man to do if you're not giving him the support that he needs over the top with safeties? You're not mixing up your blitzes. You can't get any pressure on the quarterback, so you're forced to, to, to try to cover for longer. And I think if you're Don Brown, that's where the rubber meets the road right here. I mean, we're, we're at a crossroads of Michigan football and it's not looking pretty with Wisconsin coming to town. Let's talk a little bit about the Badgers. Graham Mertz had a fantastic week one against Illinois, and then Badgers had to shut everything down because of COVID-19. As we are recording this on uh, early in the week, Barry Alvarez on Monday tweeted out, we're looking good, we're excited to play Michigan, so right now we, we believe there's going to be a game. But as Michigan prepares for a Wisconsin team that hasn't played since that Illinois game, the first Friday of the Big Ten season, how do you prepare for a team that hasn't played in two weeks? And Graham Mertz showed a lot of things that we don't traditionally associate with Wisconsin football in that win over Illinois. They were throwing the ball around, and we know the Michigan secondary has had issues. So this is going to be a very interesting matchup against a Wisconsin team that was the favorite to win the Big Ten West. But all of a sudden, we don't know what Wisconsin is right now because they haven't been able to play. They haven't been able to practice. What they are going to be like Saturday night, we don't know. Hopefully rusty. That's what I would say. Hopefully they have a lot of rust. If you're if you're a Michigan fan, that's about all you can hope for because the way that that offense pushed the ball down the field through the air, I think is highly concerning. You think of Wisconsin, you think of a great running back, and you think of uh, just hogs up front, right? You're talking about big offensive line. I was down in the field, uh, what was it, 2018 when Wisconsin was in town, and while standing next to the Wisconsin offensive line, I mean, I, I would consider myself a grown man. I felt like a child. Um, it was, you know, I'm six foot three. I felt like a little kid. Like if any of these guys put their hands on me, I'm going to find myself in a lot of trouble, Mark. That's where I was going to be. So when you think of Wisconsin offense, you think of their ability to pound the rock. Uh, now, all of a sudden, uh, what, what Merch showed in week number one was the fact that they have a legitimate option at quarterback, uh, at least against Illinois. So, you know, take it for what it's worth, because, I mean, I thought all things were sunshine and rainbows after week one against Minnesota, but that proved to be a farce as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Hopefully the Wisconsin is rusty and Michigan can make some changes and tinker with the defense a little bit to try to be able to stop Mertz from passing that ball down the field. But once again, it comes down to who's going to be filling in for Aiden Hutchison. How are they going to rotate along the defensive line? How are they going to mix, mix up their blitz schemes in, in order to help their secondary? And, and what to expect from Wisconsin? I don't know if anybody knows, uh, just because you only have one game tape uh, with Mertz really on it, playing significant amount of snaps. So 
Uh, you take that tape, you look at every play that was successful and what didn't work, what got to him and what didn't get to him. And you try to devise a game plan uh, according, uh, accordingly, because if not, it, you're looking at one and three. And I, I know that Jim Harbaugh said that they're close. I don't see it. Uh, I, I hate I hate to speak that way because there was nobody more excited than me six years ago uh, when he was hired. Like, I, I mean, and it's partially people like me's fault who are for thinking that, hey, this guy, he's an alumni. He is going to save the program. He's t he's taken a team of Colin Kaepernick and the San Francisco 49ers to the Super Bowl, only to lose to his brother. So, I mean, that's got to be a rough kitchen table talk to begin with. Uh, but, you know, you, you look at what Jim Harbaugh has has done and what he's really failed to do at Michigan. And it's it's damn near heartbreaking, to be honest with you, Mark, where the program is at right now, where the fan base is at, where the alumni base is at and where this team is at. Because, I you know, I'm looking at guys on the sidelines. I'm not seeing a lot of juice. I don't see a lot of excitement. I feel like I'm more excited uh, to talk to you tonight, Mark, than that team was on the sidelines on Saturday. And they're, and they're supposed to be out there hitting people. So I don't really know what to make of it, but they they better get their heads screwed on straight on Saturday against Wisconsin or everybody's in for a world of hurt. One of the great parlor games of the 21st century is press conference psychology, reading too much into what we're reading, what we're seeing in press conferences. And on Monday, when Jim Harbaugh met with the media, it wasn't a formal press conference, it was the Zoom because of 2020. He, he talked about one of his young players who got into the game against Indiana and he saw the quiver in the lip and the snot bubble and he, and he saw the passion. We haven't seen that same type of passion from Jim Harbaugh. Now, his players will defend him and say he is passionate about Michigan football, but we haven't seen that passion from Jim Harbaugh really since 2016, really since the Big Ten put in some rules about flagging coaches without a warning. So we've seen Jim Harbaugh dial it back on the sidelines for fear of getting a penalty, and now there is concern that has carried over, that that passion is lacking for the team. And when he was pressed on Monday about his future, he, he went back to the, I'll let my actions speak, and my actions are I'm going to be in Michigan. But when Asked how long you want to be in Michigan, he, he didn't want to answer that question. He kept on saying, there's no point in me answering that question because what's going to be written will be written. People are going to say I'm going to be rumored to go to the NFL, but I'm going to be in Michigan. I want to be in Michigan. But that passion is, is what I think some Michigan fans are wondering. Where is that passion for Jim Harbaugh? You know, it's interesting because at first it was like, well, this is way too much. And now that it's not there, it's like, well, where is it? And, and it's a kind of a vicious cycle because you want your head coach to be engaged and involved. And I think that he is. I think that you can, you know, you can look right here in our own backyard at the glass bowl and Jason Candle. He's a very animated coach on the sidelines. If he sees something he doesn't like, he is going to let everybody and their mother know that he is not a fan of whatever just took place. And I think we saw a lot of that in those early years uh, with Jim Harbaugh. And you mentioned 2016, which I think is a very important year. That is the year of the quote unquote JT was short, right? Was JT Barrett really short on that sneak or was he not? Ask Whitmer's own Chris Wormley. He will say on his deathbed that JT Barrett was short of that first down, uh, the, the line to gain in order to move the sticks there. And I think that that was such a crushing defeat looking back on it now. Maybe that was the turning point right there that we just weren't aware of, uh, where that can really suck the life out of a competitor. Because when you are as competitive as Jim Harbaugh is and as any head football coach is, you know, you don't get into the head coaching role in college football unless you're a little goofy. Like, let's just be honest. There is a certain level of psychology that it takes to be in that grind 365 days out of the year. And there's only a select handful that are very successful at doing it. And that makes you really appreciate the Nick Saban and the Davo Sweeney's in the Ryan days of the world, the guys that have taken their programs, uh, you know, really to the next level because they're so engaged in what is going on. I don't even know how they function outside of the facility, to be honest with you. And when you look at Jim Harbaugh, you think of the headset toss, you think of some of the rants on the sidelines, you, you kind of like that passion, but you want him to tone it down because he's the head coach and he's the face of the program. But then at the same time, he has toned it down. It's like, well, did he lose that passion? I think that this is really one of the interesting questions that we don't know the answer to until maybe we look, you know, five, 10 years down the road, or, you know, there's a network that, that decides to do a documentary on him where we get to, to really sit down and get a feel for what happened here in Michigan, because we're living in it right now. And it's just so difficult to decipher what's actually happening. He said they're close. I don't believe it. Uh, he said that they're, they're energetic and they have a zest for it. I don't know if I see that either. I just, I, I'm really, you know, I see, I feel like guys on the couch have more juice uh, than those that are out, out there on the field. I know that isn't true, but that's just what it feels like. It is 2020. The only thing we know for certain in 2020 is that we don't know. Well, on Saturday, we'll at least know the result of Wisconsin and Michigan and maybe probably get a couple of answers about both, uh, maybe get a couple of answers about both the Badgers and the Wolverines programs going forward. What do I think Anthony Bellino from Fox Sports Radio, the Morning Blitz on 1230 here in Toledo. Anthony, thank you for your time as always. Thank you, Mark.